están muy atrás. Sí. Sí. Bueno, para, para la tercera sesión. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you again for um, having me here. And um, I just want to get another piece of paper out if you can get some of it. Okay. 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 Welcome to those of you who are new. Uh, my name is Melissa Moyer, and I come from the Autonoma Universidad Autónoma in Barcelona. And uh, I did a, a lengthier introduction in the previous session, so I won't go into it here. But uh, basically, I'll be talking about and following up on some of the ideas that I presented in the previous session. So those of you who are new, and who do not follow me or you have a question, uh, please stop me and ask me to explain. Um, I, um, this session, I basically want to go over um, what it is that, um, or what are the um, main ideas behind a critical or practicing a critical sociolinguistic um, approach. Of, or using a, a critical sociolinguistic framework. Um, and then in the third session, uh, I, I'm going to ask people to participate more actively, and I'm, I'll also ask people to come forward for the third, third session, which will be more of a practical analysis and practicing how to do critical sociolinguistic um, analysis. Uh, without the ethnography behind it, so it will be a, a challenge here. Okay, good. Um, so, um, I, in, in trying to think of, I mean, there, there's no book about critical sociolinguistic field uh, research, so I was trying to summarize what I thought it is that I do. Um, and what other colleagues of mine do. And I think um, I've come to a set of ideas that will perhaps help you to understand what it is to be involved in this kind of enterprise. So I would say that basically what characterizes a critical sociolinguistic approach to language use and language practices is that it seeks to problematize and explain language practices that take place in society in order to critically analyze the ways those practices shed light on ideologies of language and society and on relations of power, social difference, and social inequality, okay, in a, in a, in a very general definition. So by language practices, for example, bilingualism, uh, but there are other kinds of, 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 of language practices one could um, analyze. For example, language practices that take place in institutional context or in institutional settings. Uh, but I think bilingualism is perhaps a relevant one here for um, Galicia, as it is in Catalonia. And so, um, language practices, one of the key ideas about this kind of approach are a social construct. Okay, uh, a social construct that need um, practices that are a social construct that need to be described and interpreted as an element of the social and cultural practices of sets of speakers, rather than as a fixed object existing in nature to be discovered by an objective observer. And here, I guess, what I would like to point out is that. This is a, an important paradigm difference from those who are accustomed to doing descriptive or, or a kind of linguistics that is concerned with the language system, whether it's synchronic, diachronic, whether it is about structure or cognitive models to account for structure. Okay? Uh, language is being treated as something objective 
that um, one can generalize about, whereas um, in the case of the approach that we take, um, we take language in society as being constructed, and therefore that can be interpreted. So this is an important, uh, I think, understanding that's relevant to understand the kind of enterprise that we're um, involved in. Um, a third point about the kind of research we do is that it's an ethnographic approach. Um, again here, like in the previous section when I touched upon transcription and we really didn't have time to go into the actual practice of doing transcriptions and all the complications that are involved, I mean I could have spent a whole day um, going over the different steps and discussing what your ideas were about it, it would be the same for me to talk about what ethnography is and what an ethnographic approach is about. But there, uh, I'll try to explain, explain briefly because it is a discipline that comes mainly from the field of anthropology, but which has been applied by many successful sociolinguists like Del Heim. Even Laval um, considered that ethnographic participant observation work in the communities where he collected objective uh, data in order to analyze variation, um, it was important for him to spend time in the community doing what is called participant observation. Okay, ethnographic field work is about generating a different kind of knowledge, um, a different kind of understanding of society that we cannot get to by simply analyzing or quantifying language, uh, like in the variationist sociolinguistic paradigm, which is about taking a linguistic form, typically a phonological form in the case of, of Lebov, and correlating it with social variables in order to try to begin to understand how language is changing synchronically and what that may tell us about how long language in the long term is going to change. And um, Lebov developed a whole set of methodological um, instruments in order to, to obtain his data and to get it. In ethnography, um, we're starting from different kinds of assumptions about the data we collect. For one, any kind of data, um, in our case we're interested in language data, which may come from interviews, from texts, from actual interactions, uh, but we also take into account um, other kinds of social and cultural behavior which will help us to interpret and to triangulate or to test the, the, the reliability of our interpretations. So while we're saying that the idea is that um, social reality is something that's constructed, that it's constructed through social uh, linguistic practices and that these linguistic practices in order to understand what function what meaning they have in a society for a group of people um, we need to um, we need to um, we need to interpret and in order to interpret we need to take into account different kinds of data one kind of data that we talked about was uh, uh, interactional data and this is what um, I showed you in the previous session how to go about collecting and representing um, this particular kind of, of data that's used in um, critical sociolinguistic approaches. So, um, point number four here is that reality, as I said, is socially constructed, and it's constrained on the basis of symbolic and material structural constraints that are empirically observable. And I gave several examples in the previous session about how language and knowing certain languages gives a person access to certain spaces in society, um, to, um, to the ability to interact with certain kinds of people. So to be educated allows you to interact in a certain way with certain kinds of citizens, or to know Catalan in the case of in Catalonia allows you to work as a civil servant, whereas if you don't know Catalan, you may not be able to work as a civil servant because it's a bilingual community where you must know both languages. So, um, so the idea that um, the rules of society 
are established by some people and they get constructed and the meanings then that get associated with knowing or not knowing and the way these languages are used are something that's purely decided in society. It's not something objective that remains the same over time and space. So um, this, as I said, is an important point that the approach that we're taking is is that social reality is constructed and therefore um, through the tools we have in doing ethnography we can uh, arrive at an interpretation which is about generating a certain kind of knowledge that will allow us to understand social processes. Social processes like globalization, social processes like social inclusion or exclusion and the way that it's carried out through language in particular contexts. It's a way of understanding how what we do by talking to each other in daily interactions, what does that have to do with the larger social reality? And this is one of the questions that people like um, Erickson has developed, and I don't have a blackboard here, but uh, again, yeah, oh, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, Frederick Erickson on talk is social theory, um, where he is, I recommend this book, um, because here he approaches this problem of precisely how it is that what we do when we talk to our next door neighbor, how that can be a reflection of wider societal processes. And, and I think in the previous session, again, I, I suggested that uh, one of the ways of making that link is taking into account the context of, of the different kinds of uh, institutions in society that shape us, like the nation state, like the new economy, like uh, concrete institutions and representation of the state. And what I want to argue is that one of the ways to get access to understanding how language is used among a set of people is by doing ethnographic fieldwork. Ethnographic fieldwork is a kind of method that's used in our in critical sociolinguistics and in linguistic anthropology. Um, and it involves going out into the field and, uh, and observing. And as an outside member, it means trying to see the world from the view of the users or the people who you're studying. Or the other way around, if you're studying your own community, is the ability to make your own community rare, to gain the distance that you need to get an objective look on what's going on. So this is what is known as the ethnographic version of the observer's paradox. In other words, what is the influence of the researcher on their interpretation? And this is why ethnography is a very reflexive process, because you have to be present, and you have to re uh, reflect on what your role is in the interpretation that you're giving. It's never going to be neutral, but it needs to be stated, okay? And um, just like choosing to study one structure over another structure or using a certain kind of data that may not be representative of, of the kind of ideal speaker that you want to study some cognitive process. Um, basically, what I, 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 um, what I want to say is that neutrality, as I said earlier, is something that doesn't exist, whether you think you're doing a more descriptive, objective thing rather than doing something else, because when you're describing standard English language, which is what we often do in the English department, and it's what we teach. I mean, even though I don't believe in it, I do teach standard English. Um, because the reality of speakers who don't speak standard English is, is what's out there. So what we're doing, in a way, is an idealization of, of what things should be. But who decides what standard English is about? and who gets to use it, and who has access to it, and how. So this is, would be a way of problematizing what it is that we consider the object of our study. So in ethnography, I'm arguing that, that it's not a neutral position we're taking either. Perhaps we're more conscious of the kind of position we're taking, and we make it explicit. And the kind of position that we're taking is a critical approach, which is one that problematizes that asks the who, what, when, why, and whose interests are being served, which are very basic, mundane questions to ask. But through using an ethnographic me uh, method and gathering different kinds of data that can be used to 
triangulate, we get a picture and a kind of knowledge that helps us to understand society in a way that other methods do not allow, or at least this is what I'm arguing. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to have people disagree with me. <laughs> so in providing an interpretation of how social reality gets constructed, a researcher needs to take responsibility for his or her historically, historical and socially situated subjectivity. And ethnographies are, um, are about giving participants, uh, are not, I'm sorry, the end is missing here. Ethnographies are not about giving participants a voice which is some ways that ethnography is misunderstood. What we're doing is, is representing the point of view of the actual users, but um, in a critical sociolinguistic approach, it's often the people who you record and what they say, they don't have a full understanding of how what they're saying represents a larger social process. So what I'm going to argue is that the ethnographer is the person who's informed and studying, who's able to make this link of what's happening on the ground, locally, and situated interactions like the kinds you were transcribing or was showing to you easily, and how that is connected to larger issues. And that's what we consider the job uh, in the kind of research that we're doing, to be able to make those links by doing ethnography, finding different kinds of data that will support the interpretations that we are giving. Okay? Um, any questions up to here? <laughs> okay, so as a kind of summary of some of the things that I think are important, and some of them are, are repetitions from the previous system, is that I think we need to understand the kind of approach we're taking is, is that we're framing language use in a different paradigm. What we consider data, the types of questions we're asking, and how to prove those questions, how to determine whether one interpretation is better than another or more reliable than another that's going to, whether an interpretation is going to apply to other cases in a society is something that um, requires a different kind of method, a different kind of ways of asking questions. In other words, a different ontology and um, um, which are things we believe about the nature of reality and a different epistemology, and what we come to know, um, and how we come to know that reality, what counts as data about how to come to know a certain reality. So, um, also, it's, it's not a deductive kind of thinking, which is typical in, in proposing modeling, when you model language in, in, in abstract terms, but it's more an inductive way of thinking um, that um, generates a different kind of knowledge. Knowledge that can be used in very practical ways. I mean, it, this is often a debate um, that we find with sociologists as opposed to people who do more sociologist linguistic or sociology of language as opposed to anthropological thinking is that, um, again, in the field of sociolinguistics you have people like Fishman, people like um, Ferguson, people who have been reflecting on language in, in a very kind of um, in, in, in a very kind of macro social way um, and often statistics uh, and representing uh, language use in terms of statistics or idealized models like I, I don't know if you're all familiar with diglossia and the proposal of a high language and a low language that Ferguson used to explain different communities throughout the world during the 50s and 60s. Um, and it, it, and it, it, it's a useful term still today in order to understand how a situation works. But it doesn't get to issues like power, it doesn't get to issues like control, issues of agency resistance that, that, that go on when um, in language practices. So, so yeah. So, um, I would like to characterize this as, as a different kind of paradigm, which is about generating a different kind of knowledge that's not so much based on, on the statistical representation of how many languages are used, or it's not based on, um, on calculating 
uh, which people use which language and which circumstances, who speaks what language to whom, when, and where, which is a typical Fishman um, article to explain bilingualism and multilingualism. Um, then I, I think that um, another one of the assumptions that in critical sociolinguistics is, is the idea of different conceptions of language. And just, I'm not going to go over this again, but just for those people who, who weren't in the first session, these were just some of the ideas about language or notions of language that we work with. Language is a commodity, language is a resource for information, the regimentation of language, language is an ideological practice, language as the expression of identity, institutional identity, or personal identity, or national identity, which are just some <coughs> of the issues that uh, our understandings of language that we take out. Um, okay. Um, so, so basically, what I, what I want to argue is that um, in a critical sociolinguistic framework, there are certain kinds of concepts that will help us to understand how power is carried out and exercised in society. And, um, and uh, again, and here I'm making a call for interdisciplinarity. I think it's um, in, in, I don't think there's any training that I know of, even in the United States, in Britain, or definitely not here, in my experience in Spain. Um, the kind of, I mean, for a long time, sociolinguistics has been the practice of language use devoid of social theory. And what I want to argue for is that we need to begin to be trained in social theory and thinking about ideas of looking at and understanding society that come from other disciplines like sociology and anthropology. <coughs> um, and some of the key notions that are useful or have been useful to our team and to me in trying to understand um, uh, how power is exercised, <coughs> how social exclusion ex exercise, how local practices can be connected to larger processes, I needed to use theory. And some of the theoretical notions that were useful for me to try to understand the phenomena that we were analyzing are notions of language, nationalism, and the nation state. And here, what I would like to do is kind of unravel a question that came up in the previous um, session about bilingualism. And, um, and um, the question was, for those of you who were not present, was we were looking at an example of, um, of a doctor-patient interaction and uh, no, we were talking about the notion of language and institutional identity. And what I did is I showed a picture of a Catalan health card and the information that accompanied it that was totally in Catalan. And so one of the questions that was asked was, well, aren't you in a bilingual community and, and shouldn't those languages be used? Okay, so this is the question that was framed. And part of the answer I'll go into, but then I'll, uh, is, is, did, did I reproduce that? Did I, did I reproduce it properly? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I don't know whether to go into this first or to pull it apart and then to go into it, but perhaps maybe we can pull it apart before we, we go into what I want to say. And, and where, where, where does the question come from? I mean, there were actually several questions. I don't know if the other person is here or, or there was a, there was another woman who, who asked this. Yeah. Um, <coughs> where did that question come from? You're asking me? To yeah. Well, <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just wondering, because you said before that uh, Catalonia is a bilingual, bilingual community. community. So I just wondered why that was The health card was just that from one language. Okay. Because you said that that's the institution. So it's the institution. 
is located in a bilingual community. I don't know. Does that seem accepted? Yeah, no, no. I'm throwing it back at you, and I, I now, uh, um, I, I now want us to pull it apart and try to think why that question was asked. Yeah, well, I asked it because I studied uh, linguistic politics of Catalonia, and I thought that I understood that they have to put it into the two languages. I'm, I, I won't say that I'm in favor of that, but that's what I remember. Uh -huh. So I was wondering. Okay, okay. Any other comments people want to make about that question? Or? So basically what I'm hearing is that, okay, because it's a bilingual community, both languages need to be used in, the, in, in certain instances, or all instances, or... Yeah, well, they kind of say that the people have the right to use Spanish in right. Catalonia. Yes. And that's why it's, uh, and when you get the letter sometimes, something normally you have one side Catalan and the other side Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But the card is too small. Excuse me? But just, they can't, the name is just too small. Yeah. So, so what happens in Galicia? In health, for example. In health, uh, it's the same, I guess. I mean, yeah. theory, we should get all the official documents in one language. But do you? Um, most of most them. Of them. In, well, I'm not sure about the The most menu, of, was it? Most, most of the menu. Lunch. Yes. Yes. The lunch menu was just the... Well, that's, 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 that's not an official. But yeah. that's not an official. An official. <laughs> it's not an institution. Yeah. 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 But it's a practice that's carried on inside. Okay, well... Um, basically, I, 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 I mean, I think we need to question what is it, okay, um, where does this idea come from that, um, that each country has to have one language that represents its identity? I mean, um, um, and, and how, I, I mean, it, we need to go back to the time historically when nation states started to become a political entity that, um, that needed to be constructed. And so it was about power, it was about creating identity, it was about creating national borders. And part of this is uh, language played a, a very crucial role in defining what a state was, what a nation is. And still today, um, I don't know, but in Catalonia, for example, the idea that one has a culture and a language, language is always there as an element of a different identity. So the way that language becomes enmeshed with identity, um, with, with, uh, with national identity, um, is something that didn't always exist. It goes back to just to the time when nation states were created, to the 19th century, before at other times in history, um, it, it wasn't a problem to, to move around and to speak different languages. It wasn't an issue until this came about, or it wasn't such an important issue. So, in a way, the point that I want to make is that it somehow become naturalized and unquestioned this connection of language and nationality, okay? And, and um, it, it's... In other words, we, we think that it's natural that every country ought to have a language, okay? And so, for example, in some of the research that we've been doing in health centers, for example, um, what we found is this ideology of one nation, one nation state and one language is actually the wrong way of trying to understand reality because what we found is a lot of public money was being used to create documents, multilingual documents, in order to give information to migrants in the healthcare center that we were working at. And um, what we found is that, one, they were written documents, they were produced in writing. Um, another was that the typical languages that were used were uh, st um, uh, standard Arabic, uh, French, English, um, those were the uh, Russian, I believe, uh, not even German. So 
Um, the languages that were chosen were based on nation state languages, but the kinds of migration that we had were people, one, who didn't know how to read and write, so to produce written documents was an ill-placed kind of ideology about how information should be transmitted. And also it turns out that many of the speakers were Berber, Arabic speakers, or um, they were from uh, different parts of China that didn't speak Mandarin Chinese. Um, and so this idea of, of how um, the way communication should proceed in institutional context to migrants didn't correspond in the least to, to, to what the social reality was of people who were coming to the healthcare center. And we also found that, that this idea of producing these documents in written form wasn't helpful either. And another ideology that we found is that, um, that uh, standard language was the best way of communicating to people. And when we did our multi-sided ethnography of three different institutional sites, and uh, the research that I'm reporting on is based on a project with HUD where we compared a public institution, which was a health clinic, a private institution, which was a locutorio, and then Telefonica, and the third institution that we looked at is an NGO, um, a transnational NGO, but which worked together with Caritas, with the trade unions, UGT, Comisiones. And um, actually, by doing a multi-sided ethnography, by having different members of the team go into three different sites over a period of three years, we began to understand what kind of ideologies we're going on here. And what we found is that in cases of private uh, businesses uh, in the telecommunications sector, what we found is that the way people worked in locutorios, which um, the one we studied was an example of an ethnically owned uh, locutorio by a Pakistani man, um, what people were communicating in they were code switching all the time, they were mixing languages all the time, and they were understanding each other all the time. So another one of these ideologies that we need to talk in a standard variety of a nation state language is also um, ill-placed when it comes to the practical reality of what is happening. <coughs> so, um, I, I mean, I wanted to I mean, I was going to pose the question, why is it important to question these hegemonic ideologies about, um, about um, why uh, one nation has to have one language when the actual reality is very diverse? We need to come to some idea that it's about defining areas of power with respect to the nation state. So in Catalonia, the importance of language is an important of language with respect to the Spanish state. So basically what you're seeing when language is brought into the nationalism equation is you see a repetition of what's happening at the nation state level at the local level. <coughs> and it's the same kind of ideology working up there as down there. And both are very exclusionary. Mm -hmm. So, um, so basically what we're arguing is that we need to problematize this equation or this one-to-one this, um, this -one relation of nation or nation-state and a single language because basically what it's proposing or the, the ideas behind it is that <coughs> people need to speak and act in a certain way. And this is, I think, where your questions come from. From the idea that, okay, um, bilingualism has to be constructed in one particular way. And that means equality of the two languages <coughs> with the health card. But there are other ways of putting bilingualism and multilingualism together because de facto, if someone goes to the healthcare center and asks for something in Spanish, it's not a problem. I mean, you heard the, the last transcription that we had. It was a very Catalan doctor. I don't know if you noticed it by the accent. 
it, it wasn't something that we commented on, but it was a very Catalan accent. He's a very Catalan speaker, and um, he was speaking Spanish to them. I mean, I, I published an article on that where what I was claiming is that that this is a doctor, a young doctor. I mean, I'm finishing telling you about the transcription. Some of you haven't heard it, but it was an interview with a um, Catalan medical doctor and a, man, a patient from Pakistan. <coughs> and they exchanged. The Pakistani man didn't know Spanish very well. And, um, and the doctor was Catalan. And so the doctor could have chosen to speak Catalan to this man who hardly knew very much Spanish or not. So, why did we speak Catalan to him? And this is something that bothered me for a very long time as a researcher. I said, this is a young doctor. He's working at this health clinic because he's incredibly motivated and he wants to help migrants. He's one of these idealist doctors. And here he is speaking Spanish to them rather than Catalan. Knowing that one of the social meanings of speaking Spanish is a form of categorization. <coughs> it's associating, I mean, speaking Spanish does not have one unique meaning in Catalonia. The Catalan bourgeoisie during the Civil War and after spoke Spanish, so it's not just that. But as, as anthropological linguists, we need to be aware of what different meanings can be. And in the case of a migrant who doesn't have very many economic resources, it's not the same for him to speak Spanish or her to speak Spanish than for uh, a judge from Madrid who works in the courts in, in Barcelona speaking Spanish who comes from the middle upper class. So it's, it's, it, it requires that you can't just be simplistic and apply the same. You need to look at interactions, you need to look at context. And this is what we're advocating in the kind of approach that we're taking. So, but the case of this doctor, it had me puzzled because I couldn't, I couldn't say, well, he really wants to help these people, but he's carrying out a language practice that's totally exclusionary. It's not giving him access to a language that uh, might give him some social mobility, and it doesn't really matter because if he doesn't know Spanish too well, he's not going to know Catalan. I mean, you know, it's not going to make such a big difference to speak Catalan to him. Um, but what, what's, what, what are the ideologies behind this doctor's mind? The doctor's intentions when I interviewed him was that, oh, he'll be able to understand Spanish better. Okay? Or he might travel to some other part of Spain and Spanish will be useful. <coughs> or a typical Catalan explanation, Spanish is going to be more useful than Catalan. So the Catalans have an ambiguity with their language, which is, on the one hand, it's our identity, but at the same time, it's not good enough. It's, it's not a good language. So, so it's important to understand this, that there's these meanings that exist. And you can't get to that kind of thing unless you do interviews, unless you know the society, unless you do ethnographic fieldwork. <coughs> and you have evidence from different sectors of society that will support that. So this is what we would need to look at. And I finally came to the conclusion after reading a sociologist who is, um, who, um, I don't know whether I like as a person, but anyways, his sociological ideas or interests is Anthony Giddens um, about, um, about the under, how individual actions can have unintended consequences. And I think for linguists this is a relevant point because often when we analyze language, we want to automatically associate it with speaker intention. I mean, this is something, the whole field of pragmatic speech act theory and the whole elocutionary force in, in different dimensions of, of language are analyzed. But for me, in the approach we were taking, it was something that bothered me because clearly this guy had good intentions. <coughs> and if I, if I wanted to explain what was going on, I needed to find some other kind of conceptual mechanism for understanding how it was being exclusionary doing it. And it's, a, so, I, I mean, I had to bring into account that these were intentions, I mean, it had consequences that was not intended by the doctor, which is something also that 
I think, yeah, that I think is relevant, but it helped me to explain better what was happening. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. Um, so, um, So I've basically gone over all of these points here by through the examples that I've gone over, like some institutional practices and consequences stemming from linguistic ideologies that connect nation and language. And then the idealization about standard languages and linguistic hybridity, <coughs> which I talk about in the case of the Locutorio Telefonica. <coughs> helpful conceptual framework is, is looking at how language, uh, looking at language in the new economy. And I, I touched upon it a bit when I was talking about false centers and the commodification of language in the previous session. I mean, I think that, again, here this requires a bit of knowledge about um, how the economy has developed over history, how we started out as a very rural society, how we moved into an industrial society, and today, Spain especially is a service society. The main um, income comes from tourism. The jobs that a lot of us are doing are service jobs. By service jobs, or the tertiary sector, what we're referring to are office workers, call centers, university professors, medical doctors. All of this is providing a service of some kind. You're not producing something mechanically <clears throat> like people did in factories and things. And I, I mean, I know this is very obvious and very simple, but I think that linguists, we, we don't think about these things in connection to language. And um, I, the point that I want to make is these different kinds of economy and the thinking behind um, the way economy works today has an influence on the kind of talk and the different kinds of language that we value. So the whole commodification of language is definitely a product of the new jobs that have been created uh, uh, in call centers, uh, in the change from an industrial society to uh, a service society, which happened especially after the 1970s with the, 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 the crisis of the petroleum, which became very expensive and people couldn't rely on it. And, I mean, that created a lot of unemployment. There was kind of a crash. And so um, we need to also think about how also the way of thinking of a neoliberal economic system is influencing our lives today at the university and what we do with our time and what we're doing. The whole idea of free competitions, the whole idea of accountability, the whole idea of measuring things in terms of cost and money is not just out of the blue to become more efficient. It's about money and how much money is going to the public university system. Are taxpayers getting what they, I mean, we need to put it in the context of, of a wider situation and, and what is happening. And so this is, again, um, where we really need to have an understanding and a an training in these kinds of ideas and conceptual and theoretical framework. So, um, one of the areas that we're also researching is language and tourism. Sorry, uh, I was thinking about commodification. Yes. How do you translate that in Spanish? Acomodación? No, acomodación, no. Uh, comodificación de la lengua. Mm -hmm. Co uh, uh, oh, 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 no, mercantilización. Mercantilización. Sí, perdón. La mercantilización. Mercantilización de la lengua. ¿Cómo se tradujo Marx lo de camarería? Mercantilización de la lengua. Es, es el valor económico que tiene eh, el conocimiento de la lengua. Y es, um, the two people who are really good to read on that, again, I'm going to send a list of bibliographic, I'll do it for you, is Monica Heller. <coughs> Um, in her recent book in 2011, Past to Post-Nationalism. And it's about language. It's about language. Um, uh, 
Um, the other book that's really good is Deborah Cameron. Who talks about the commodification of language as well. Um, and I forget the date, but the title of it is Good to Talk. <clears throat> and this is published by uh, Oxford University Press. Um, so, um, there are other authors who talk about this, Sasha Saskin. Um, I'm going to do a bibliography and, and send you Sasha Saskin. But these are people from other domains, but who um, have helpful ideas that are useful to us. And they're not that, all that complicated for someone who doesn't have a sociology or political science training. Especially when you're asking the questions that you're asking about how language plays a role in what's happening in these wider social processes. Okay. Um, another important um, element in understanding how language is taken up today is um, globalization. And of course, globalization is one of those terms that everybody defines in a different way. But for language, I think, and what we're trying to study, it has specific meanings that I'd like to point out. I mean, the whole idea of the compression of space and time, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, <coughs> this Moroccan call center, um, the way that call centers work is that companies can be providing service 24 hours a day because uh, they can be calling from Canada, they can be calling from, from India, and um, there's always someone in the right time zone who are there. So that, that's one way in which um, doing work is no longer uh, takes the time that it used to take uh, to send a letter or to uh, speak on the telephone and get somebody to reply with internet, um, with, um, with uh, the systems of communication that we have today. Um, distance, uh, uh, catching a plane and going home, uh, in the case of migrants or so on, are, are things that um, have changed communication and the way people communicate with each other. And to give you one example is, for example, the, the migrant population that we study in Barcelona is that um, <clears throat> they continue to be in contact with their families through Skype, through computers, through uh, telephone, by using locutorios. They go back to their country all the time. They send money back. So there, there's a constant going and coming back in ways that, that 20 years ago or 15 years ago, it wasn't thinkable, okay? So this idea that one can get anywhere, anytime, um, that one can continue to be a part of the life of someone who's 8,000 kilometers away is something that's new to us. And it's shaping the communication patterns, and it's something that we need to study as linguists, and we need to understand how it's changing the way we communicate with each other. I mean. There are plenty of studies about the internet and how people are no longer seeing people in face-to-face -face interactions, but how they're communicating um, virtually over distance. Uh, they're communicating with people who they don't know, which is something that never happened before. And there are certain kinds of interactions that are going on that, or even organizing relationships, uh, couples relationships. A lot of it goes on, on over the internet, which is something that years ago, those kinds of social relations only could take place in face-to-face -face, uh, kinds of situations at the most, or at least in our society. Um, so um, these changes in the way we're living our lives that have to do with uh, the more um, intensity of the communication and the mobility of people, of the way we transmit information and the way that products can be sent across the world. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. I was in South Africa this summer and I was, you know, I, I was running into the same stores that I found in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where my daughter lives. 
And um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, this, is, this doesn't make sense. I mean, it's 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 the, you know these these multinationals who are in a way are are have more importance than nation states for countries because in fact the multinational that pulls out of a country and these people unemployed, for example, is something that taxpayers and a nation state needs to deal with. But they're decisions that are not made by a nation state but by a company who needs to make a profit. And these are things that are happening all the time. They're not talked about in this way, but they're talked about, oh, it's cheaper to produce cars in Czechia or in the Czech Republic rather than in Spain, for example, in Cali, which is where one of the car companies pulled out, for example. So um, things that we see reported on in the newspaper that are happening are connected to the way people can move around over space and time in ways that before just didn't exist. And this has consequences for people's lives and for the way people communicate and what they're doing. So, um, or identity over time and space. There's a really beautiful example by Jan Blomart about a Tanzanian who uh, was part of the upper class in Tanzania and uh, knowing English in Tanzania was, um, is a sign of your social class. It means you're educated, it, it means that, um, that you belong to an elite, and so on. This person, when the person moved to, to London, <laughs> no, it still is. Knowing English has, has okay, in many places it still has, but for example, the, the, the notion of an individual's identity in Tanzania, when this person, this is a person who Jan knew, when he moved to London, uh, it was a totally different story about how this person had to negotiate with the people in his daily life where there was racism about his identity. He was seen as an African, uh, a marginal sector of society, a person who presumably would be problematic just because of the color of his skin. And um, so we need to understand identity in a dynamic way. And we need to understand identity over time and space and in the way that language comes in to that equation of identity. And uh, th this example um, is just one. I mean, for example, Maria Antes was asking me, well, where are you from? And I said, well, I have five <laughs> answers about where I'm from. You know, I was born in the United States. I was brought up in southern Spain. I went back to college in the United States. I married a Spaniard. I've been living in Barcelona for 30 years, where I feel very identified with Catalan culture. Um, I'm not a nationalist, but I speak Catalan with an English accent. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, if I tell you that I have American nationality, it really doesn't... I have hardly lived in the United States except the years that I've been there teaching or doing research or doing my graduate work or my undergraduate work. I mean, what does it mean to give and to classify or categorize a person according to their nationality, especially in this day and age when people move around so much. I mean, all of a sudden you start thinking that what's important is the way you associate with people or the kind of people who you share something in common rather than from being from a place. And I know it may sound weird because Spain is a country where people are usually born, married, uh, stay until, so that it, it, uh, I know I'm, I'm preaching in a place where there's a strong sense of being from the place where you're from, but we're living in a society where, yes, it, where it's rarer and rarer. I mean, one of the studies that we're working on, in fact, is on tourism. Um, one of my students is, is um, and I myself, and I hope to be in Britain working on language tourism, people who go to London to learn English, um, about how, how identity is sold through language. Um, and um, it's really interesting in trying to understand, and I mean this is one of my sociolinguistic interests that I, I hope to pursue in, in the new project we have, is 
is the intersection of, of different kinds of mobile citizens. Because to be a mobile citizen can mean that you're cosmopolitan and, and your language is of value. But if you're not, if you, if you don't travel for leisure, you travel for work or better life chances, your languages are valued so highly. So I'm, I'm very interested in how social class and mobility, how the intersection of social class and different, the way different people can be mobile and for what purposes, whether it's for leisure or for uh, better work chances, how does that affect, how does their uh, bilingualism or multilingualism or their language, how is that connected to their, to their migration or their mobility trajectory? And I'm interested in getting into narratives. And this is kind of the line that we want to take now, is about how people um, narrate their, their migration and their language experiences. And this is kind of, um, so I'm, this is kind of the area that I'm interested in pursuing at the moment. So, basically, um, how public, private, and NGO institutions deal with linguistic diversity and manage their multilingualism. I've told you a bit about how the public hospital does it, how the, let's see how we're doing for time, we have about an hour, so I better stop in about a few minutes. But it's interesting um, that what we've found is that the practices, the different multilingual practices with, um, well, the, the challenge that migrants have posed to the different institutions, public, private, and NGO, have been dealt with in different ways. And um, basically, um, a lot of these ways of dealing with it have to do with ideologies about migrants, and also about different styles of organization of the institution. <coughs> So what we've been able to do is we've been able to trace how different <clears throat> different ways of um, different ways of organizing multilingualism has to do with whether it's a very hierarchical structure. So, uh, like at the health clinic and at the NGO, it's a very top-down process, and so their view of migrants is that oh, these poor little people who need help, and so. What you find, for example, I, I didn't show you these examples in the last class, but what you find is, for example, these migrants don't know, they don't have agency, and this is another element that I wanted to talk about. They need to be told what to do, um, um, and that, um, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, so, yeah, they, they, there are people who, who uh, need to be taken care of. They can't take their life, if they're not empowered to take their life in their own hands. So these organizational structures and these top-down organizations, which are very hierarchical, are ones that produce certain kinds of language practices as opposed to the locutorio, which is a call shop where people go to write, uh, to write on the computer or to Skype or to, to use one of the telephone booths or to buy a phone card that's really cheap to call Latin America or some other place. In these places, you find that um, there's a much more horizontal kind of, of situation because you find migrants uh, interacting with other migrants. There are relations of exploitation. I'm not saying that they're not. That there are because a lot of these ethnically owned businesses contract people from their home country and treat them and really. But in terms of the kinds of multilingual practices, they don't get dictated from above. It's just what people do to manage to communicate. And one of the advantages that these call shops we found are having over like uh, Vodafone or Orange or Telefonica Movistar is that um, they're more flexible in terms of their multilingualism, whereas these big institutions um, if you call a number, if you call the customer service, you might get somebody who speaks English. Or you might get somebody who speaks Catalan. Well, now that's more, they paid more attention to the Catalan thing because people have gotten really angry in, in, in Catalonia. But, um, Telefonica, but not Vodafone and some of these other things. I, I don't know if here they speak Galician, these big companies or not. <laughs> So, 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 yeah, so what, what we were finding is that call shops are much more multilingual, much more flexible. The communication strategies are much more hybrid 
than what we find like in private multinationals. Okay? So that was interesting. That was interesting for us. And that's something that emerged out of doing what we call a multi-sided ethnography. If we just studied one site, we wouldn't have been able to, to have the full view of what is happening. Okay, so again, this is a, kind of another way of triangulating because you're looking at a similar kind of phenomenon in three different places. Um, and, and then, yeah, I, I won't go into this, but this is um, another. So, um, the other point that I want to make is that language practices play a key role in the reproduction of social, political, and an economic order. And this is kind of related to a question that I was talking about with Maria Ankeles, um, or Ankeles, um, about, <laughs> or Ankela, <laughs> about, um, about often people who are not familiar with qualitative research, one can ask, well, is one case representative of what's happening? Because often when one does sociolinguistic research, they say, oh, you need lots of numbers or you need a representative sample. Whereas in ethnographic work, um, what you need to do is to choose the context. You need to study where you get your data, how that is representative of a given language practice. You're looking for a pattern in language practice, which you gain by the very time-consuming uh, data collection process which is involved in doing ethnographic field work. Okay, um, some of the other kinds of questions that we're asking um, in the work we're doing are issues of, of agency. Um, and um, again, um, we, we don't adopt the simplistic deterministic approach that language is determined by necessarily, but it's shape. Uh, but there's always room for individual agency. And again here, this is another um, theoretical elaboration that Giddens, I think, makes a really nice contribution to, is that everybody has the freedom of speaking or saying one thing or another. And even though the consequences it's small, or the effect of it is small, um, I mean, you can't go against the capitalist system, but you can resist the capitalist system, and there are many forms of resistance, and this is precisely one, an article that I've been working on now, that the, how resistance, migrant resistance, can be expressed through language. And, and I've talked about indirect or unintended exclusion. So I think here I'll put an end to session two, and um, what I would really like um, uh, is if people can come forward for this third session because the third session I want you to work a bit in groups a little bit and to look at the data and I want to try to do things. So the people in the back, could you come forward please? And um, has everyone picked up a copy of the data that's sitting back there at the table? Okay, good.
individually or however you want. I'd like you to um, go over these seven pages of data. Um, okay, um, so what I want to accomplish here is to see what it is that you understand and what questions would emerge from looking at this data. What would you want to find out? This is data that was collected in an ethnographic study of a transnational NGO, um, which is a religiously inspired NGO. It's, um, it has a Catholic orientation, although the founder was originally a Catholic priest. He, um, he, um, he later, he later came out, but it's still this Christian idea of this. So, um, I want you to think about several things. I want you to think about what kinds of critical social questions you would be interested in knowing about. What does this data tell you? What understanding do you gain about the NGO? And so here I've included two kinds of data. Data from the language class with the teachers. Um, data from the actual language itself, um, and also um, some data about the housing project. So this NGO provides housing for the migrants under the condition that they take a Spanish language class. Okay? So I'll stop here and let's see what comes out of looking at this data. What questions occur to you? that are not explained, or what would you want to try to know? What would you try to understand? What does this data suggest to you? So, um, either we can go over it together, or, but I mean, you can go over it in pairs and talk it over with each other. I mean, that's, that's not a problem. I thought maybe we could take about 10 minutes, 15 minutes for you to go over the data a little bit, and so you can see what it's about, and see what comes out. And if you have any questions in the meantime, you can ask, okay? So, rather than doing an ethnography, I'm providing you with the ethnographic data that you have it. So you're, you're missing a part of the ethnography, which is observing, knowing the people, seeing their faces, hearing the recording. But I've, I've, I've tried to provide different kinds of data. Not to get only extract one? No. Everything? Yeah, this is hard work. Yeah, what does R-E-S stand for? Research or Researcher and teacher. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry, I should have explained that. <laughs> TEA is the teacher, but if you look, data set one is an interview with a Spanish language teacher responsible for teaching students from, and then the other person is a researcher. Mm -hmm. 